Yeah. There's only a small bit of application, but it's the big experiment. So hopefully it will work out. Then we'll get the PDF files from this. You can add those to your typewritten notes if you need them. It might not be all that necessary either, but it's something anyway. You said there are distance students doing this though, right? One, at least one. Looks like one of the other people dropped. Oh, right. So, <laughs> yeah, it's kind of a small class. Yeah. We're lucky yeah. it's still running. I'm glad it's <laughs> running now, because they don't cancel it. They won't cancel it once it's up and running, will they? I don't think they're going to cancel this because the other the other online student is committed, and we have our we have four people, so that's enough people. Yeah, that's that's fine. Let's see. Okay. Well, let's get started. Are there any questions from last time? Well, not really about the material so far, but I, I don't know. Just kind of a request: Would we be able to just? Do the spectral stuff, I mean, rather than the fixed point? I mean, you mentioned you Yes, we will. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I'd just really rather do that than the other Good. Fixed You'd rather do the spectral theory than yeah, the fixed yeah. point stuff, and that's what I planned. Okay. I have planned not to do the okay. fixed point it's stuff. Context, yeah, <laughs> I'll try to get as much of it as I can, too. I mean, no. maybe we'll, we might have to go at light speed. <laughs> However, I turned the mic on. Is it working? So let's, uh, today I want to talk about um, metric spaces and Bonnock spaces and give some examples. It will be a lot of review from math uh, from a modern analysis two course, but it's the stuff in chapter one, roughly speaking, that we skipped. So I need to go back over that. First we have uh, normed space. So I'm going to have a start with the vector space. So X is a vector space. And then we have with a norm defined on it. And we mentioned that we mentioned the properties of the norm last time. They are that the norm of a vector x is not negative. The norm of x is equal to zero if and only if x is the zero vector. Oops. which sometimes we denoted by theta, the zero vector. And uh, then the two others are that the, uh, the scaling, if I take a scalar multiple of x, then the norm of alpha times x is the absolute value of alpha times the norm of x. And finally, the triangle inequality. The norm of x plus y less than or equal to the norm of x plus the norm of y. So whenever we have a, such a setup, you have what's called a norm space. OK. Let's uh, have an example. Let's have an example uh, where we, I mentioned last time that this, sometimes this can be a little tricky to check. The second, uh, the second one. So let's try that uh, in an example. So let's take uh, x is the continuous functions on the unit interval, and uh, I'm going to take the norm to be defined by. Of course, we don't know it's a norm yet, but I'm going to propose this to be a norm. <laughs> Propose this norm equal to the integral 0 to 1 of the absolute value of the function. So this is, this is the tau, just the uh, substitution variable to do the integration. 
So I have a continuous function I'm uh, integrating its absolute value. Well, obviously that's not negative. Um, the scaling is kind of obvious. If I multiply the function by alpha, then I could pull that out. So those are all kind of obvious. Non negativity. Check scaling property. of norm checks okay uh, triangle inequality that's simply the triangle inequality in the real numbers then integrated I'll take x of tau plus y of tau. So x and I'm going to denote functions by x, x of t. So the independent variable is going to be t. So instead of f of x, we'll use x of t. That's the uh, bargain in this business. I just use the triangle inequality on the inside of the integral. And so we easily obtain the triangle inequality. In this context, and now what's the last one I need to check? So there's triangle inequality checks. Okay. And what's the last one? I need to check, check whether The norm of x equal to zero implies that x is equal to zero. Because obviously the other one goes. If I have the zero function, then its norm will be zero. The integral of the zero function is zero, but does that imply that doesn't imply that the, if the norm is zero, then the function should be zero. So we need to check that. Any ideas about that? Okay. Assuming the, assume that the function evaluates to a non-zero root number at any given point. Um, okay. Good. Yeah. So the suggestion by Matt is work by contradiction. Uh, assume there was a non-zero function whose norm was zero, and then try to prove a contradiction from that. Very good. Yeah, that's how we'll do it. Let's do that. So let's go, th let's go through that together if we can. Let's see. So um, assume by contradiction, by the method of contradiction, that, that the norm of x equal integral 0 to x tau d tau, the absolute values, is equal to 0, but x of t naught is unequal to zero for some t naught in the interval zero to one. So what should we use to uh, get a contradiction? What kind of function is x? Continuous function, excellent. <laughs> That's pretty much all we have. So we have to use the continuity. How could I use the continuity? We want to, so, so let's draw a picture. Draw a picture. You have a continuous function in the interval intuitively if, if it goes off the axis, if the, if the graph goes off the axis here at t naught, here's one, here's zero, then then you should, what are we teaching calculus? So you can graph the function without taking a pen off the board, right? <laughs> maybe that's true and maybe it's not. But intuitively, that's how it works. Right? Somehow. So it has, the function has to go out and fold. So what would happen then? You have a non 
yeah, well, okay, let's say we don't have anything about differentiability, but what about the integral? You would assume, you'd say, well, there must be some area under that curve, right? I'm just taking the case that this is the absolute value of x, let's say. So this is the absolute value of x of t, all right? That I'm graphing here, so I can just work the non-negative case, all right? That's a continuous function also. So use the continuity. So here's, here's what we can do. Let epsilon equals the absolute value of x of t naught divided by 2. That's a, great, that's a positive number, strictly positive number. Then by continuity, whoops. That's cute. <laughs> of um, x, there exists, of the function x, there exists uh, 0 less than delta less than uh, 1 half. I may have to bring in the interval a little bit. Uh, some delta less than 1 half. So that if t minus t naught is less than delta, then x of t minus x of t naught in absolute value is less than epsilon. That's standard definition of continuity. So we take epsilon to be this height. I've, I've divided this height by 2 and say, well, okay, now um, so that's going to be my height. I'm saying if my x my x of t, no matter, this, this function x of t here, it can't drop down less than epsilon, this half this height. Okay, so that means for, on a whole interval delta around here, that means the function is going to have to be above here. In other words, I'm going to have a little piece of curve stuck above a certain level for over a whole interval delta here. Make sense? Therefore, by uh, triangle inequality type computation, I have x of t in absolute value greater than or equal to x of t naught minus epsilon which is equal to epsilon because I chose the way I chose epsilon. Let's see, that's just some triangle inequality business. Um, what, I, what I'm using is that this thing, this thing itself is greater than or equal to x of t in absolute value minus x of t naught in absolute value. That's a reverse triangle inequality. All right, so that's being used. Used here. Any question about that? Technology, <laughs> technology. Uh, there is a reference in the book for this one. Okay, so that means x of t is bigger than epsilon on an interval of length at least delta. All right. The only uh, you would say, well, why isn't the interval of length two delta? Okay, because I have t minus t naught less than delta. But well, because t naught might be all the way to the end here. All right, so I might only have interval of length delta. So, so x of t in absolute value is greater than or equal to epsilon on an interval of length at least delta. Okay. Does it jibe with the picture? 
I said was, uh, here, here, here's my function, here's, here's the level epsilon. The function is above that level epsilon. <clears throat> Over a whole interval of length, uh, here in this picture was two delta. Okay, because I added small delta. All right. So that gets the contradiction because then I'm not going to go through the theory of the integral, <laughs> but it's obvious then by theory of integral, by construction of integral. Then integral x of tau d tau, 0 to 1, is greater than or equal to epsilon times delta, which is greater than 0. And that's a contradiction. To our assumption, we assume that we assume that uh, the norm, which now we can call a norm, okay, was zero. Here we've shown that the norm is positive. This is the this is my symbol for contradiction. I think everybody has their own. Just in case you were wondering, okay, questions about this. So, so that's that's that one kind of action that gets shoved, shoved off into the dark corners. <laughs> Nobody wants to think about that one. <laughs> he did twenty of those. <laughs> did you do this one? Oh, you did this one. Okay, good. All right. So now we're going to switch a little gear, gears a little bit. We're going to talk um, about. Um, a metric space of which this norm space is an example. A norm space is an example of a metric space. So I want to talk about something just a little bit more general. Because the norm space has the vector space in the background. You can add things, scale and multiply, and so on. In a metric space, you can just take distance. So, for example, if you're uh, on the unit circle, you, you add two vectors, you're not going to stay on the unit circle. Okay, if you're a scalar you multiplier, you're going to go off the unit circle, but the unit circle is a good metric space. You can take the distance between two points. Okay. So, what's a metri metric space? Uh, a norm space is a metric space with distance. dxy defined to be the norm of the difference x minus y. Where a metric <coughs> metric space is simply a space of points with a metric on it satisfying certain axioms which are also given in the text, page 3 of the text. Uh, metric, with a metric space is a set of points or elements uh, with a metric, I'll call the set of elements still X. X will still be our name for a metric space. Why not? It's just the, the superset of points with a metric uh, D, which is a function um, on pairs of these elements to the non-negative real numbers, finite real numbers, satisfying d of x, y, of course, greater than or equal to zero. That actually follows from this notation. This notation says d of x, y has got to be greater than or equal to zero. This is for x, y, and d. And x, y in, in the space, um, d x, y equal to zero if and only if x equal to y. So that corresponds to that axiom we had before. Um, dx, y equals dy, x. Um, 
and the triangle inequality, dxz, excuse me, dxy, oops, plus or equal to dxz plus dzy. This is for x, y, and z elements of our space. So if you did take the unit circle, you could take the distance between two points in the unit circle as the minimal arc length between the two points. That would be a distance. Okay. <laughs> okay, this distance between two points, for example. All right. So a norm vector, a norm space is a metric space. You can easily verify from the axioms of the norm that exactly all these metric space axioms hold. Okay, but it also has one other property, and that is that it, the in the norm space the metric also has another property, that is this translation invariant in a norm space. we have for any x, y, and a in x, all right, then x plus a and y plus a also in x, and that the norm of x minus y is equal to the norm of x plus a minus y plus a, obviously. So on the one hand, this is the distance between x and y. On the other hand, this is the distance between x plus a and y plus a. So that means that the distance is translation invariant. So you may have a metric on some space but that's not a metric given by a norm. I think there's an, there's an example in the book on that one. Uh, let me show you that. Yes, we mentioned sequence space last time. In chapter one, the author has defined a metric on sequence space. This is an example um, 2.2-8 from the book you have sequence space S that's a vector space we mentioned but we didn't put a norm on it this is just all sequences we didn't, if we in one case we because that those sequences could be unbounded for example so that wasn't the same thing as little l infinity where we actually did make the sequences be bounded. Okay, and then we had a norm there. So this is just a, a raw set of sequences, bounded or unbounded. That's a vector space. You can define a metric on that space uh, by cook up some formula that works. Okay? <laughs> uh, and a metric, dxy, if x is a bunch of c's, remember that business, c2 and so on? Our notation and y is a, is a sequence of etas. Then you can define a dxy by um, summation 1 over 2 to the j, uh, cj minus eta j over 1 plus absolute value of cj minus eta j. One can verify this is a metric. j goes from 1 to infinity. Notice that with this metric, because this, this quotient is always less than 1, it only becomes 1 in the, in the limit. Uh, uh, Cj minus Aj goes to infinity. All right, so this is always a factor less than 1, so this distance is always less than 1, for example, because of the sum of the geometric series being equal to 1. 
So that's kind of a strange little thing. You can see that, well, see, would it only, it's obviously not negative. To be zero, every term must be zero. Therefore, Cj must equal a to j for every term. Um, triangle inequality, yeah, it's a little bit harder. Okay, you have to work a little bit with the algebra. Okay. The scaling is okay. Uh, well, actually, no, 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 no. I'm sorry, triangle inequality. There is no scaling for the metric case. I don't have to worry about scaling. The scaling doesn't work, right? But um, also, um, that's one way to see it. <laughs> okay, it wouldn't be given by a norm. Okay, and I think the way he he stated it in the text was it would be easy to see that it's not translation invariant. In other words. I do have a vector space structure for S, but now I suppose I put in uh, suppose I translate things. Okay, so for example, um, if I had um, if I had uh, C is one zero 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 and so on. That's C, and I take A to just to be zero zero zero. Okay, that's then I get the distance, which is I guess one half. Okay, and now let's say I translate both of those vectors by. Um, Let's say A equals minus 1, 1. Let's just try, try it and see if it works. <laughs> okay. What would that? That would turn. Um, does that work? I don't know. That doesn't seem to work. What happens to. Oh, yeah. It's in the. It becomes. The, 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 uh, you basically shift it. Mm, that doesn't seem to work. Well, let's try something. Let's try that one. It doesn't work. <laughs> okay, let's try one different one. Zero two. Okay. So add zero two to everybody. What happens? Does that change anything? No, that doesn't do anything. Huh. This is befuddling me for a moment. Anybody else see it? Yes. Yeah, we just cancel out. So that doesn't seem to be the problem. So what is the problem? I guess the scaling is the problem. But why is he saying that the translation invariance is a problem here? I don't know. I'm leave that open for next time. Okay. Let's leave that open. Doesn't seem to be a problem there. I think the scaling is definitely a problem, though. If I multiply by two. Let's take alpha equals 2. Okay, if I multiply by alpha equals to 2, because of this 1 down here, this 1 plus business, what's going to happen? I'm going to have um, 2, 0, and 2, 0 here, so I'm going to have 2 divided by 3. Okay. Two thirds of one half instead of uh, two times one half. Okay, so then the scaling breaks down. Okay, scaling breaks down.
<laughs> Maybe he had the error in the book. I haven't seen too many errors in this book. Okay, questions about this? So this metric is not given by a norm. That brings us to what's the definition of a, of a Bonnock space? Well, we need to review what's the, what's the concept of convergence and Cauchy sequence first, because the definition of a Bonnock space involves the definition of Cauchy sequence. So, what is a what is a what's this convergence in a metric space? Let's review this quickly. Okay. Xn goes to X in a metric space. Means limit n goes to infinity of the distance between Xn and X is equal to zero. Alright, so I just I just I don't even have to bring out the epsilons. Right? I just say, oh we already know the concept of limit of real numbers. So I just say, okay, apply the distance, see if it goes to zero or not. If it goes to zero then the, there we have convergence. Period. And if not, no. Okay? <clears throat> so that's that's easy. Now what about a Cauchy sequence? Okay, xn is Cauchy in x if, well then I have, to use, I have to bring out the epsilon because there is no limit x specified in the case of a Cauchy sequence. I have to say the sequence is close to itself. So I really do need the epsilon here. If for every epsilon greater than zero, there exists a capital N natural number so that if M and N are greater than or equal to capital N, then the distance between XM and XN is less than epsilon. That's a Cauchy sequence. There's one other thing we might want, and that's uh, a bounded sequence. Does that make sense in a metric space? What's a bounded sequence? Sorry about that. Xn in X means there exists in M greater than or equal to zero, so that the distance between x n and some fixed element b, let's say, uh, less or equal to m for every n equals one, two, three, etc., be some element of x. So you don't have necessarily a natural origin. If I was talking about the unit circle, I might just take B to be the point one zero. We don't really need to ask the value. Uh, no, no absolute value. Correct. <laughs> Distance is non-negative. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Questions about this? The bounded sequence? Okay. So automatically you get certain things. What? A convergence sequence is always Cauchy. Cauchy. A convergence sequence is always Cauchy. And a, and a Cauchy sequence is always bounded. 
So, convergent implies Cauchy implies bounded. It's down the line here. Okay. But of course, we can have, we know many examples of bounded sequences that are just, you know, in the real line. One minus one, one minus one. That, that's not Cauchy. Therefore, certainly not convergent. So there's no reverse implication uh, on the bottom here. Okay, but what about on the top implication? Could, does Cauchy sequence imply convergent? In the real line, we know it does. Also true for complex numbers. What we do is we make a definition. If Cauchy sequence implies convergent sequence, then we call the metric space uh, complete. All right. In gen okay. If every Cauchy sequence in a metric space X is also convergent in X, then we call X a complete metric space. Right. Cauchy sequence Conver a Cauchy sequence implies convergent sequence. The Cauchy sequence is always convergent. True in real line. Okay? R and C are complete uh, as metric spaces. Also, as norm spaces, <laughs> norm spaces. I mean, they're also norm spaces. They have that extra structure, right? They have the norm, <clears throat> and um, and we can also get. I think in in the chapter one, he he does the little work where he also does R N and C N. It's a little, it's a so finite dimensional Euclidean space, complete. Do you know some other complete spaces? Yes, they do. Do you know, remember one from your previous modern analysis course or something like that? Is there anything you remember about what are the theorems involving uniform convergence of continuous functions? <laughs> remember that stuff? Remember this? Recall this one. Recall a theorem from analysis. Um, if fn, well, maybe I should put it x's because that's what we've been talking about. Okay, if x, xn is a uh, uniformly convergent sequence of functions in C01. So we have xn equals xn of t. Zero less or equal to t less or equal to one. That's a, that's a sequence of functions. And if it's uniformly convergent, uniformly convergent means uh, uh, there exists, so, uh, well, okay. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, not uniformly convergent, uniformly Cauchy. That's what I want. Uniformly Cauchy. Sequence of functions in C01. So that means for every epsilon greater than zero, Uh, there exists a capital N so that 
M and N greater than or equal to N imply that the, sup that the maximum XM of T minus XN of T, that's the sup norm, T between 0 and 1 in this maximum is less than epsilon. So that's the Cauchy condition in C01 with the supremum norm. This is simply saying that the so-called supremum norm, which you're going to verify is a norm okay, in your homework, is less than epsilon. Okay, the supremum norm. So this this would be x m minus x n in in terms of the notation we have developed so far, uh, less than epsilon. Okay. 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 So what does that give? Um, If I have a uniformly Cauchy sequence of functions, and so I describe what that means here, for every epsilon greater than zero, there is this holds for all m and n bigger than capital N, then what's the conclusion in that theorem from analysis? Then um, xn converges uniformly to a continuous function. <laughs> okay. Then xn converges uniformly okay to x in c01 what we know how what's the sketch of the proof the sketch of the proof is well just roughly is that for each t xn of t will be a cauchy sequence in the real line. So uh, limit xn of t, which we'll call x of t exists. So that we just want to show now that this x of t really is a continuous function. So you need to show that it's a continuous function, and there's a three quote unquote three epsilon proof <laughs> to do that. Uh, so I refer you to your your analysis text. One of your analysis texts. Um, we can go over it again, but I don't, I don't want to spend the time on it at this moment. Okay. So first, you find that the function exists, and then you say, okay, let's show that it's continuous, and I get, you know, I have uniform convergence to it. So show, show, show. X of t is continuous. And uh, max x n of t minus x of t zero less or equal to t less or equal to one uh, goes to zero as n goes to infinity. Okay. So I left out the hard part, <laughs> but it can be done. Okay. So that means what you've shown here with all this business sketch of, of proofs. So this is a sketch of the conclusion. I've, this, this was the theorem. Okay, this is a statement of the theorem. If I have a uniformly Cauchy sequence of functions, meaning this, okay, then indeed xn converges uniformly to x in C01, which means, of course, that xn minus x one's going to zero. That, in other words, the distance from xn to x is going to zero. In other words, xn is convergent in the metric space, C01. So just regarding it as a metric space. 
So I have convergence. That's what the, state, the theorem states. If I have uniform Cauchy, then I have convergence, in fact. So now with this language we have, you just reinterpret this, this, this analysis there as statement of completeness of this metric space, C01. And then there's the little sketch here. Comments about this? So we have that one is complete. And as you mentioned, Travis, uh, little l infinity is shown to be text. And there are, uh, in chapter one, in fact, in fact a number of, uh, of spaces were shown to be complete. So there's an index, okay, or a kind of a catalog <clears throat> of those results. Very good. Uh, now there is one other uh, statement I made in these notes. Um, this is the bolzano weierstrass property um, or theorem that um, gives you completeness in the real line. In the the uh, so let me just make a note of that. And what was that bolzano weierstrass theorem of property? bolzano weierstrass theorem of property says if you have a bounded sequence, then it has the subsequence that converges. bolzano weierstrass a bounded sequence in R has a convergent subsequence. If that property is true with R replaced by metric space, then once you get the convergence subsequence, you have a limit. And the cohere sequence is drawn to that limit automatically because it's close to itself and therefore it's close to the limit. So anytime you have the property that the bounded sequence has a convergent subsequence, or any kind of sequence has a convergent subsequence for that matter, okay? <laughs> All right, though necessarily it would have to be a bounded sequence to begin with if, it was eventually, if you were going to have a Cauchy sequence. So it was thinking of having a Cauchy sequence and checking to see whether the sequence is complete, uh, convergent in order to check the property of completeness. All right, so we're thinking of having a Cauchy sequence. Well, the Bolzano Wireless property tells you any bounded sequence. What about the sequence then, like you were saying before, 1, negative 1, 1, negative 1? That's a bounded sequence. What would the convergent subsequence be? Yeah, convergence subsequence would be 1, 1, 1, 1, 1. But that doesn't converge, does it? No, it does not. The, the sequence in, in total doesn't converge. Of course, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1 does converge. Here's the thing. If I had a Cauchy sequence, then it would be bounded. The bounded sequence has a convergent subsequence in R, okay? Then the whole sequence, because it's Cauchy, is drawn to the same limit as the subsequence. I guess I'm just not convinced that that one 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 would, would converge. Then uh, if it's if something wrong, I mean, how's no, that? No, well, one. That's if I have a sequence, oh, it's constantly I was one. Oh, the sum of them. For some oh, no, no. Okay, yeah. that's right. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. The sequence does. The sequence yeah. one 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 does converge. Jeffers was thinking of the sum. He was on a different uh, yeah. planet. That's all right. <laughs> we get there all the time. All right. So. So a bounded sequence has a convergent subsequence, which implies, um, okay, so, so therefore, in R, a Cauchy sequence, okay, will converge because Cauchy implies bounded, <coughs> which implies uh, convergent subsequence, and 
it's easy, an easy lemma in any context, in any metric space, and in any metric space. Cauchy sequence plus convergent subsequence implies convergent sequence. Okay. So that was the, the comment. That's basically how it would work. So when you're discussing uh, completeness of possible completeness of other metric spaces, you just keep these things in mind. What's the metric space that isn't complete? Well, there are plenty of them. Basically, what you have to do is take out the limit <laughs> that would have happened. So, an incomplete metric space is nothing harder than taking away a point. So, I'm going to take um, the half closed half open interval 0, 1 in R. Any subset of a known metric space is again a metric space with the same metric because all it's required is that I have a distance having the certain properties. So that's going to be uh, a metric space with the Euclidean metric. Just ordinary distance between two real numbers. All right. So uh, what I'll take is my Cauchy sequence. I'll just take a. Uh, what should I take as a Cauchy sequence? As an example, that will be a sequence, a Cauchy sequence that doesn't converge. Just anyone. Point nine, point nine nine, point nine nine nine, point nine 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 nine. Yeah, that looks good. So that's. Um, 1 minus point 0.1 to the n. Okay. <laughs> All right. This goes to, um, this is, this go, okay, this is clearly Cauchy in 0, 1. It, the, the main thing is that it's a set of, it's a sequence, I'll put sequence notation. Sequence is Cauchy in 0, 1. The elements are, uh, it's not convergent in 0, 1 because there's no limit that belongs to 0, 1, but it's Cauchy. So this is, this is the trick. Um, if I call that xn equals this, so xn minus xm is equal to uh, 0 0.1 to the m minus 0 0.1 to the n. All right. That's um, that's uh, less than uh, an absolute value. Point one to the minimum of n and m. Okay. All right. Which obviously, so, so, okay. So obviously, given epsilon, I can find my capital N. All right? But limit Xn does not exist in 0, 1. Okay. Limit x n goes to infinity. All right. So there is an incomplete metric space. <laughs> Simple? Questions about it? No. Okay. So the Bonnock space. Definition is simply a complete norm space.
So some examples we just mentioned were uh, examples C01 with uh, the norm of X equals the maximum 0 less or equal to T less or equal to 1 of absolute value of X of T. That's a complete norm space, a Bonnach space. A uh, little L infinity equals a set of all bounded sequences C1, C2, and so on. With um, the norm of X. X was the sequence. X, norm of X equal to the uh, supremum of the CJ. Okay. That's shown in chapter one. Um, little L1. Again, um, equals sequences with the norm of x equal to the sum of the absolute values of the cj. Okay, sometimes we call that the one norm. Okay, this sometimes we call the infinity norm. Okay. And we already showed a, an in, a non -complete, another non-complete space. No, we didn't show it. What's another example of a non-complete space? Uh, an infinite dimensional non-complete space. That might be more interesting. Right, so let's consider that. Um, these are examples of Bonnach spaces. Okay. So what's not a Bonnach space that's in this general category of an infinite dimensional vector space? Let's take C01, but now instead of with the, uh, the soup norm, here, let's take with that other norm we mentioned about earlier today, the one norm where we took the integral of the absolute value. Take, not, okay, um, take x equal to c01 with the norm equal to the integral, absolute value. Hope you can read. This is supposed to be the integral of the absolute value. <clears throat> the claim is it's not complete. Um, okay, there's a sketch in the book how to do that. Maybe I should just roughly go through it kind of quickly. Um, what you want to do is you want to take a sequence of continuous functions that's Cauchy in this norm, which also gives you the metric by differencing, right? So what you want to do is then try to uh, get uh, a Cauchy sequence that's going to converge to a uh, discontinuous function, which is not going to be in the space. Sort of like t take, the, take the point out of the space, right? So. So in this case, you have continuous ones, but the endpoint is a discontinuous one. Is that possible to do? Well, you'll see once I draw the picture. <laughs> okay, because let's just draw a picture. Something like a tent function, uh, but the tent functions, uh, well, yeah, I mean, uh, it's half of a tent function kind of. Sort of, yeah, it's like the 10 function example. Let's just see that. Um, what I'm going to do is draw a picture of here's 0, 1, and here's 1 half. I need the function to have some variation, right? So I'm going to make it go from 0 to 1. I'm going to make it 0 here. I'm going to make it 1 over here. And then I'm going to just make it linearly steep here, okay? And make this transition 
zone small. So make it steep slope. So let's take this one half plus one over n here. And so this is going to be xn of t. That's clearly a continuous function. And as n gets bigger, it just gets steeper and steeper. The uh, integral of the difference won't be much. The integral of the difference will just be, if I take m bigger than n, then I'll just have another one that's just going up like this. And I'll have a transition zone, which is at maximum just the smaller of the two indices, okay, by 1 over the smaller. Okay, So I'll have a small transition zone. So there'll just be some garbage in there to integrate. <laughs> and so the integral of the difference will be small, and absolute and the integral of the absolute value of the difference will be small. But what's happening? What's the limit here? A step function, exactly. So you have xn of t. And then you have an xm of t. I can make another picture. It's the same thing. Let's say m is bigger than n, just for simplicity. And so that I've got this one like that. OK, if I take the difference. Just put superimpose those two pictures, <laughs> OK? That's not too hard. So here's 1 half plus. Did we run out of time yet? No, I'm sorry to interrupt. I just want to be here. OK. 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 What did I do there? Uh, OK, so I put both functions on the same axes. Uh, oh, this was the smaller one. This was 1 half plus 1 over n. Yeah, I had that. This, one. this was the point 1 half plus 1 over n, which basically comes down like this. OK, so yeah, that's not a very good picture, but it, I think you're getting it. So. This is xn, and this is xm. xm was the steeper one. Okay, so the integral xm of t minus xn of t, which is the l1, which is the one norm between xm and xn, is less than or equal to. Um, 1 over the minimum of n and m. OK. So it's a Cauchy sequence. Cauchy sequence. Boy, that's going to be some bad PDF files. OK. <laughs> uh, but xn of t goes to x of t equals to 0 for t less than or equal to half and 1 for uh, 1 half less than t less than or equal to 1, which is discontinuous. So in the nutshell, you might have to do a little bit more work, but you need to prove there is no continuous limit. This is actually not doing it yet. They didn't prove there's no continuous limit. I'm just saying point-wise, x n of t goes to x of t equals to this discontinuous function. So it's kind of intuitively obvious there's no continuous limit. It actually takes a little bit more work if you actually get down on your hands and knees and actually prove there's no continuous limit. Did it one time, and it's kind of a pain. You have to assume that there's a continuous limit and, you know, 
work. <laughs> but there's your, you know, the idea is clear. So there's a little bit of work left. Uh, therefore, no continuous limit. There are some details omitted. Okay, so let's close that one. That's a non Bonach space. One last thing I want to talk about before we go today, and that is um, closed set. What's a closed set in a metric space? This is also something you had in, in your previous analysis course, but we need to talk about that. So, what's a closed set? M in X. X a metric space. Contains all its limit points. Exactly. I said that contains all its limit points. So what's a limit point? <laughs> okay. So first the definition of I'm gonna that's one equivalent definition of closed. I'm gonna give an alternative equivalent definition of closed. First. This is just the way I've organized it in the notes. So uh, M is closed if forever if the following uh, situation hold um, well I want I don't want to do the for all if the situation X n goes to X in X with X n a sequence in M. So I have a sequence in M, and it does convert to some point in X. Implies. So this this statement implies that X belongs to M. Right. So we have a certain situation. You're setting up a situation where you've got a sequence in M, and it's converging to some point in the bigger space, at least. Whenever that happens, then the limit must in fact be an M. If that's so, then M is said to be closed. So it's kind of a nice definition. And then what Joyce was saying is that, that is equivalent to um, M containing all its limit points. So what's a limit point? Limit point or point of accumulation is two synonymous terms for the same exact thing. One of those rare circumstances. <laughs> uh, limit point or point of accumulation of M is x in x such that there exists a sequence x n in m take away the singleton point x with x n converging to x. So the reason I have to take this point X away is that um, I can have M to be just a finite set, for example. A finite set, and, and then uh, none of the points would be so-called limit points because, uh, well, this doesn't make sense. Limit point means that the set piles up there. Well, the set doesn't pile up at an isolated point. So you want to take away the isolated points. We want the set to be piling up. Okay? If you had just a finite set of points, then there would be a minimal distance positive between any two points in the set. Just by taking the minimum dxi xj. 
right? So nobody's getting close to anybody else, <laughs> no matter what sequence you, do, you take in that situation. So that's the point of accumulation. So the theorem is that uh, M closed if and only if um, M contains all its limit points. Okay. So that's the theorem what you had and um, what we'll say also is that then we define M bar, we're almost done here, M bar is defined to be M union limit points of M. Okay. What you do there is you add all the possible limit points in and that gives you a closed set. It takes a little bit of proof. It's kind of intuitively obvious, it takes a little proof, but that would be a closed set. So M bar bar is the set equal to M bar. Okay, you don't, you can't add any more. Okay, M bar isn't, is bigger than M, but it doesn't have any more limit points. So M bar already contains all its limit points, so M bar is closed. M bar is closed, it is the smallest, and it is the smallest closed set containing M. Okay. Okay, I think that's going to do it for today. We have uh, one more example. Read it up. If you, if you get the notes, please read that one more example. Uh, before next Tuesday, we're showing, there's a certain, I think it's exercise 2.3.1 and 2.3.2 um, showing uh, that a certain sequence space is closed. Uh, you're going to take um, the, uh, I think you're going to take the, uh, you're going to take the sequences in L infinity that converge to zero. So just all convergence, those are obviously all bounded. If you take just a convergent sequence, it's certainly going to be bounded, so it's going to be an L infinity. Now assume that the limit is zero. That's going to give a certain subspace. If I have a couple of sum of a couple of sequences whose limit is zero, then the limit of you know, the sum is zero also, and so on. So that's going to be a nice subspace. But is it closed? And that's and if it is then there's another theorem, closed subspace of, of complete space is complete. So then you'll have another Bonnach space. So closed subspaces of Bonnach spaces are going to be Bonnach spaces. So we'll review that a little bit as we get started next time. So, okay, so exercises do. We should today, uh, Tuesday, usually I take questions uh, about the homework. Yeah. So please, uh, if you have some, I don't know. <laughs> I'm willing to entertain them, okay? Thank you.